Welcome to the Longmont Museum, a center for culture in northern Colorado where people of all ages explore history, experience art, and discover new ideas through dynamic programs, exhibitions, and events. My name is Justin Beach. I'm the manager of the museum's Stewart Auditorium, and we are coming at you live and direct from the Stewart this evening via the magic of the worldwide intertube, otherwise known as the internet, um, via Facebook, Longmont Public Media, and uh, of course, uh, Comcast Cable Channel 880 here in Longmont, Colorado. Um, you know, tonight is being offered as part of our Thursday Nights at the Museum series. That's right, every Thursday evening at 7.30, we offer you a little something, a panel, a lecture, a reading, uh, maybe a little performance. Um, we, we really know how to mix it up here. And I want to thank all the people who make this pro these programs possible. The Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, otherwise known as SCFD, uh, the Stewart Family Foundation, the Friends of the Longmont Museum, our many museum donors and museum members, uh, as well as our uh, mighty media sponsor out of Deer Boulder, just down the road, uh, KGNU Community Radio. Thank you to you all. Uh, for more information about what we've got going on here at the Longmont Museum, please visit us at longmontmuseum.org. Tonight's program is uh, Agents of Change, a uh, conversation on art and social justice. From the work of artists like Anna Mendieta and Frida Kahlo to the Gorilla Girls and Judy Chicago, from the mu music of La Tigra, Anthony and the Johnsons, Freddie Mercury and Queen, David Bowie, Prince, and let's not forget Public Enemy's Fear of a Black Planet. Shall we mention film? How about Midnight Cowboy and Brokeback Mountain, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, or even Priscilla, Queen of the Desert? Then there's literature, of course, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, Allen Ginsberg's Howl, Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior, Orwell's 1984, Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. I could go on and on and on and on. Novels, poems, paintings, sculpture, photography, film, theater, music, dance, and performance, they're all potential vehicles of transformation and change, whether the work is overtly political or not. To experience art is to experience how another person views the world. It's stepping into another's shoes and seeing through their eyes for a moment. You come away looking at the world just a bit diff differently than you did before. The more art you experience, the more nuanced your worldview becomes, and the more tolerant, appreciative, and respectful you may become of others' viewpoints. Viva la difference. It's my feeling that the personal cannot help but be political. Shout out to our feminist forebears. If art is the result of a conversation or dialogue between the artists and their world, which we're invited to experience, then those who make art are engaged in shaping and directing this massive, lumbering, currently lugubrious thing we call culture. And culture is the air we humans breathe. Tonight, we are so fortunate to be joined by four agents of change, four artists of diverse backgrounds and disciplines who are making work now. Let's get to know them, shall we? Christina Pitaluga is an actor, writer, producer, creative director, teaching artist, stylist, and multimedia artist born and raised in Denver. Her love of the stage started in seventh grade during her theater class, and the rest is history. In 2014, she joined the Black Actors Guild, although she started as an intern. Good things start with interns, let me tell you. <laughs> her ideas, quick wit, and hard work earned her the title of Director of Creative Content with the Guild. She has been blessed to experience the art scenes of both Colorado and uh, somewhere called New York City. She continues to use her knowledge of theater and styling to enhance the artistic opportunities given to her. Cipriano Ortega has been fortunate enough to have his work recognized and shown both nationally and internationally. Cipriano strives to create works of art that probe the mind and make people question what they perceive as the normative. Whether that is shown in music, theater, visual art, or some sort of culmination of all of the above, Cipriano enjoys blending all creative forms of expression. As a sociological artist, Cipriano deconstructs the worlds around him, them, and observes it under a nihilistic perspective. 
as an indigenous person of color, he also has no choice but to deal with colonialism head on by making it a daily practice to see the divisions we as a society create and continue to make the normative. Juliet Lee grew up three miles from the CIA and currently lives in Denver where she works as the program director for the Chinook Fund, a community foundation dedicated to supporting grassroots community organizing work throughout the state. A former Pew Fellow in the Arts for Literature, she's held the International Artist Residencies in Video Art, Poetry, and Dance. Her books include Solar Maximum, No Comment, the serpent in, sky mean, in the sky means noise, and aerial concave without cloud. Her essays and reviews explore race, contemporary US poetry, and the avant-garde. You can find her online at silentbroadcast.com. JC Bial is from the Four Corners area of New Mexico and received his BFA in printmaking from the University of New Mexico. JC's connection to his indigenous Diné culture is heavily influenced by his inv involvement in the arts. His personal identity and background have always been present in his art because he is proud of who he is and where he comes from. Combining traditional indigenous ideologies and his personal Buddhist practice, JC is always striving to emphasize those concepts and convictions in his art. He hopes to share his beliefs by celebrating the fusion of technology and indigenous culture in his work. JC aspires to illustrate the laws of movement, unity, and impermanence in his work. And so welcome, all y'all, to uh, the Longmont Museum and to Longmont. It's so good to have you all here. Thanks for making the trek. Thank you for having us. Hey, yeah. You're yes, welcome. You. <laughs> It's refreshing to be in person, socially distanced on stage here. Um, I do have, a, I have several questions for you guys, um, but before we get there, we're gonna have each of you talk a little bit about your work, and we're gonna show some images, which I think we have all lined up and queued up and ready to go. So JC, why don't you start off? Sweet, yeah, like you said, my name is JC Bial. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to introduce myself in Navajo formally, oh, yeah. just in case there's some Navajo listeners out there. Um, so basically, that's my clanship and how I relate to my fellow Native people and, um, and how we relate to one another. So yeah, um, let's see. So I started making art at a very young age and um, one of the key things that really kind of got me going in, in, in that initiative has been uh, street art and graffiti. Um, you know, as a, as a young kid, I was really inspired by my older brother who um, was doing graffiti. So, um, you know, I kind of latched on to that and decided like, okay, I want to do that. Um, didn't necessarily think like I'll be making money to be, be a graffiti artist, but I've definitely ventured into different areas that have allowed me to um, express that type of feeling. And, um, you know, so lately I've been working um, as a muralist. I've done a few of them here recently in the Denver metro area since I've moved here in October. Um, so it's been really nice to kind of have that happen and really work out for me because it's definitely something I've been wanting to share. Um, a lot of my art, like you've said, you know, is about movement and impermanence. And um, I want to recognize like the spiritual realm that we all kind of exist with in this current uh, existence. And so, you know, so I, I acknowledge that by a lot of the geometric patterns and like particle looking um, abstract shapes that kind of float around the figures. Um, I focus on the figure a lot and um, because I, I studied the figure drawing for numerous years at the University of New Mexico and, um, is really, and was really highly encouraged to venture in that way. Um, you know, it's a personal thing for me, but, and it was told to me by this person who I did figure drawing with is if I knew how to draw people and did it proportionally well, then I could do anything. And so, and that's kind of why I stick with it. Um, so I'm kind of a stickler about proportions and all of that. So, um, but you know, yeah, definitely a lot of my culture and my identity is included in my work. 
Um, I can't deny that fact because it's, it's where I came from and where I grew up. And, um, you know, my lineage, you know, I come from a, a long line of artists, whether they're sculptors or painters. Um, and my grandfather on my father's side, you know, he was a traditional medicine man, um, hatatli, so a singer, a chanter. So, you know, for me personally, I feel like that's where my creative talents came from. Um, was for that and I feel like it's my duty to utilize my craft to help people you know find peace or feel at ease or bring some sort of uh, positive energy to their life with what I do so you know it's my personal mission to kind of in a way use my history um, and my lineage to kind of continue that effort and um, so in, in because it's healing for me as well um, so it's really nice to to be able to have the ability to express that and in a way for it to become a possible full time profession and, and, and you know, and really do what I love. Um, it's taken some time, but I'm really grateful for the opportunities that have come my way and for the different relationships that I've developed to help me get to this point. And um, so, yeah, I'm very honored to be here and um, and kind of share a little bit about my work. Yeah, you know, and shout out to Greg Deal uh, yeah. for, for, uh, for, you know, hipping me to you. Right, yeah, yeah, big up Greg Deal for sure. You know, he's been a friend of mine for, for quite some years. So it's really nice to kind of have him um, be in my corner and, and, and allow me to take some of the opportunities that were given to him and help me propel my, my career in the arts. Can you say just a little, a few words about the uh, project you have going in, in Boulder? Yeah, yeah, so I'm working with... Um, let's say like four different native artists. Uh, three of them are women, one other is a male. Um, we're basically creating um, a, a collective of sorts and um, to try to help develop um, a center there within the dairy arts in Boulder. So what we're trying to do is develop a center to um, a, give the indigenous population a platform there so they have an opportunity to to share their work and also, you know, um, have a place to do that as well. So in a, if you will, it'll be like a maker space, a research space, you know, a gallery, a little bit of everything. And I'm sure we've all kind of experienced something like that. And um, so I've been working there with them the last few months and, um, and really trying to get that going. And we're, we call ourselves the Creative Nations. Um, so um, it's, it's something that's in, in its infancy stage, but I think we're about to start crawling here real soon and, and start really making some, some waves in Boulder and really kind of allow people the opportunity to see what Native people are doing currently in contemporary arts, um, you know, and definitely kind of show them a little bit more of what we're able to do and how we communicate not only about our culture, but as human beings who exist in this present reality that we are in together. Yeah. Amazing, JC. Thanks, yeah, thank thanks you. a lot. Mm -hmm. Juliet. <laughs> sure. I, I love everything you just shared, JC. That's so great. Thank you. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, let's see. How, what was the original question? <laughs> so it's just a what little bit do? about myself. What do you do? What, what, oh, tell us yes. a little bit about okay, your, so, your work. Um, yeah, I am a poet primarily. Um, I also make video art and some installation performance work. Um, as far as like how I got started, um, wow, I love language. My parents are um, Korean immigrants, and uh, my mother was actually born in Pyongyang and fled south before during the war, before mm -hmm. the DMZ closed. Um, my father was orphaned. So we, they grew, they raised us in a very rich Korean enclave, like of mixed just like folks outside of DC. It was one of the earlier kind of like Korean American immigrant like spaces in the country. There's only like four cities that are like that. It's like LA, New York, Chicago, and DC. And we were there right when it was like kind of like growing. And my love of language came from my mom who in classic form, rather than like hiring a childcare person would just like leave us at the library until they closed. So like after school, we get scooped up in the station wagon, driven there and left there until like 9 p.m. <laughs> so um, I had a lot of opportunities to kind of get into stuff that as a child I maybe shouldn't have, like Cosmopolitan. There's no reason any nine-year-old <laughs> child should be looking at that stuff. I learned like too many things very fast and in a not good way <laughs> through that magazine. Um, but it was a great experience, just like kind of like moseying through the stacks and finding things. Um, 
My older brother, who's five years older than me, um, actually was a literature major in his college. So when he would come home from the breaks, he'd come home with these stacks of books, which I was always so fascinated by. And um, I think the big turning point for me was like the metaphysical poets, which is a really funny thing, I think, for someone as a young person to like find. But I love the performance of thought in the language itself and how dense the thinking could be and how beautiful and rich. And it just sort of showed me like poems could be entire cosmoses mm -hmm. and they could offer a different viewpoint. Um, they could perform thought differently. I felt like my brain transformed mm -hmm. like as through reading those things. Um, I didn't think I could be a writer though until um, like late in college. It just didn't seem like a space for me. I had a very like white Western normative kind of like Anglo-European training, you know, in college and in high school and stuff. And especially growing up in Virginia, it's like first point of contact into this into this country. So it was a very um, white settler dominant kind of like education I received. And when I was in college, I had the opportunity to read um, a book by Li Young Li, who's a Chinese American poet called Rose. And that just opened so many doors for me. It was really like, wow, there's people out here who have stories like kind of like my family story or like who look moderately like me and can make art. And, um, and also the writing was so beautiful. It was like lyric, really gorgeous like love poetry, poems about like making love to his pregnant wife, et cetera. So that kind of like began my interest in wanting to write. I already knew, I already enjoyed writing from a very young age. I was constantly doing it, but I never thought of it as like an art form or something that was for me. Um, yeah, and I did the thing where I got an MFA in, in creative writing. I didn't even know such programs existed. And frankly, I like applied to go to one kind of as a way to just save myself. Um, right out of college, I took an organizing position for national like public interest, democracy initiative, environmental organization. And they just worked me to death. I was working like 60 hour weeks um, on like $17,000 a year. And, um, and it was also like the first Bush election that like the Supreme Court decided. <laughs> so it was really painful like being part of this like initiative to get young people to vote and then have that like basically taken from us all. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just I was just in need of like refuge and um, Massachusetts happens to have like a fine arts MFA program at UMass Amherst. And because that's where I was living, I qualified for like in-state tuition. And I wasn't certain if I was gonna go until they offered me a scholarship last second. So that kind of like set me on this path where I got to meet with other people who were like actively writing, contributing to the conversation, um, people who were like publishing currently. And I think a lot of times what we get taught in schools are like so behind the times. And I've, I love connecting with like contemporary work because it's like pushing the conversation in new ways. Um, yeah, so I, I like to think about space, displacement, survival, like the ecological crisis we find ourselves in. Um, my writing kind of explores, early on it really explored questions of like nation building and how these abstract principles of like country and place can like completely ruin people's lives. And my family I think is a good story, example of that. And so I was really interested in like tracking these like concepts um, through like human psyche. And uh, increasingly I've been turning more to like the language of crisis. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing a lot of work um, that's examining space and place and our, the human imagination in a particular location. And I've been doing that through, um, primarily through like the prism of sunlight, mm -hmm. thinking about sunlight as language and what is it speaking into us and what are we saying back to it mm -hmm. with all these technological life forms that we're engaging in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my video work is exploring that. So I've spent time in places of like low light. So the Arctic Circle during winter, Iceland during winter, and also long light. I had the opportunity to be in Norway on an art residency during the solstice, where it was like pretty much like an infinite day. And I'm um, just observing what was happening in my body and with language, and that's where the dance components come in to like help me um, translate that into words. So that's, you know, a, a little bit of what I do. <laughs> and then professionally for work, your day job is working for the Chinook Foundation. Yes, Chinook Fund, yes. So as their program director, I support the Giving Project, which is a community grant making program um, in which volunteers come together for six months. It's a diverse collective that we recruit um, and they go through a political education process where they learn explicitly about white supremacy, 
about race and class injustice. Um, and then skill building, where they learn about our grant making process, they learn about what grassroots organizing looks like in different communities, and they learn to fundraise. And they raise collectively the funds that they then allocate out as grant makers to the community. Mm -hmm. So it's really like a wonderful community resourcing model. Um, I love how it invites people whose contributions are not always recognized to be part of like the folks who get to wield power, advocate on behalf of their communities, be seen as resourcers, you know. Um, it's really special, quite, quite special. So I lead that work for them. Amazing, totally amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cipriano. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Cipriano Ortega, and uh, kind of just thinking of back and listening to everybody else, kind of how they formulate a perspective of their own creative output. And another thing I was thinking about earlier today, and, you know, this whole talk and how I can express myself is, I was really thinking about how much film was kind of the starting point for me in a lot of the things that I do in the sense of, you know, of course, watching Disney and et cetera, but even transcending more into, you know, um, classical films as well as like Akira Kurosawa and a lot of Japanese filmmaking and uh, spaghetti westerns and et cetera. So my point to bring that up is that um, I always noticed, you know, the visual representation of things and also the soundscape that goes with it. And it wasn't until, you know, a little bit later in my life that I realized I could blend those two fields. And I first initially started off in theater and in acting. And, you know, I would go into, you know, I would go to the Arvada Center for the Arts and Humanities and do their summer camp for about, I think I did about for about five years. And I would, you know, do the traditional musical, you know, you get your role and you learn the parts and you learn the harmonies and you sing it. And that was great. That was a great experience and a good building foundation. And even prior to that, I was in the backyard, you know, putting on different costumes and acting out these different roles just by myself because I'm an only child. Um, so all that kind of pretend world, that, that discovery of like I can be, I can put on these different things and I can appear to other people in different ways. And that's always been something that's very much fascinated me, the whole concept of we're very much visual stimulated organisms that we pretty much base off of everything that we do on what we see, you know, the methodology of survival as a, as a, as a species comes from that. So how that ties into my art and into my music and into film is that I try to blend all these together as I, I try to find different people who inspire me and innovators in any of those fields, whether it be music, the innovators in those fields or in film or in, in theater or people who take something that's conventional and, and almost turn it on its head. So yes, it's theater, but it's immersive theater or yes, it's theater, but it's theater of the obscure or yes, it's theater, but it's, you know, it's melded with, you know, projections on the wall and musicians playing and the actors are not talking. So all these different ways of expressing oneself is kind of where I come from. And I went to Regis University and I studied vocal performance and music as well as business and sociology. My main emphasis and major was in sociology because I always have had a kind of had this plight and this frustration with society and the way it's constructed and the way gender roles are put on to each other, onto people, and classism and capitalism. And I always had this angst, you know, and I, I always wanted to know why. Like, why do I feel this way? Why do I feel this frustration? And I can't find this, you know, niche that everybody seems to find. You know, they find a little tribe and they find a little group and they just sit in there and they seem to thrive, some of them, most of them. And I never could find that, so I, I wanted to study sociology to understand these systematic ways to really understand where all these things come from, how they're constructed, what's the motivation behind them, how these structures are put into place and why. That's the biggest thing for me is why they're there. Because they're not just there arbitrarily, they're there for a reason and most of it, from my research and my gathering and the way I express myself, it's from greed and capitalism and just trying to keep people divided and put into these different sections to keep the greater consciousness unaware of how they're being oppressed, and whether that's being oppressed through gender, through race, through class, or all of the above. That's stuff that I want to question. So these caricatures or these people that I come up with, these mechanical puppets at the moment is what I'm exploring, is kind of how I am using my own body and my own perception to manifest this. So right now, particularly in music and soundscapes, I play with both, in, both industrial sounds you know, which shows the mechanical, very structural, intense sound of a machine, 
but then I'm also working with a two-string slide bass, which was influenced and shown to me by the beautiful band Morphine. So anybody who wants to check that out, I would definitely recommend that band. But my point is, is the lead singer and the bassist of that played a two-string slide bass. And that's kind of my new thing right now, is building these basses and understanding this frequency. Because I always liked slide guitar. And like the doors come to mind, blessing poetry and et cetera. But I never really liked guitar. I, I like guitar very much, but I never had the huge motivation to play it. But then I discovered the bass frequency. Not so much the bass instrument, but this, this machine or this instrument that can omit lower registers. And I heard that sonically, and I was like, that's me. That's what it sounds like inside here is this mm -hmm. lower guttural sludge. And I want to use, I use the lower registers of that instrumentation as well as my tenor voice to kind of present this, this um, op opposition. So it's not necessarily that we're fighting with each other per se, but it's one is, the bass is creating a foundation and my voice is creating the melodic structure. And my approach at the moment is very much minimalism. So I use a typical, you know, kind of looping bass line that I learned that I'm playing or, or recording and add poetry or spoken word or the influence of film as well too because yeah. sometimes when I'm writing and producing stuff, I think of it cinematically. I'm a very visual person, so even when I'm writing stuff lyrically, I see it as a film almost. So again, that's why I'm going back to film and how much that um, helps me form my, my creative process. And then it goes again to sociology and how can I show my internal frustrations but also remove myself enough to relate to people, because I do want to relate to people, but I also want to disassociate in the sense of like, yes, this is my personal issue, but it's everybody's issue. It's not just me that feels frustrated. I want the, the music that's helped me and the films that helped me are the underdog character or the character or the, or the song or the lyric that's like, hey, they're talking about something that no one else is talking about, yeah. but everybody seems to want to talk about it, so why are we talking about it? So. I think we have a short clip that you put together for mm -hmm. us. Have we have we shown that yet? Were you running it? Yeah, there should be some audio with that as well. I, I don't think we'll hear it, uh, unfortunately, in here. Hmm. No worries. My my friends in the booth. Oh, you're ready to roll. Okay, go ahead and roll. I sit in quiet Ladies desperation. This is a, a little piece that the silence right leads me to an inevitable conclusion of an aptitude. From this realization, I arrive at two choices, creation or apathy. I then realize that to create something, other things must be destroyed. I don't know where to start sometimes. I do know what I feel a frustration that has been with me since I realized I cannot escape. Not completely, at least. Creation or apathy. I can't lie and say I shun one and always embrace the other. With my weighted scales, I attempt to balance a corrupt system. I look at the numbers and compare myself to others. Pound by pound, it lacks merit based on all the credentials given to warrant a value. The classified section of my mind is already hired, owned, and sold. Do you keep all your receipts? All right. the the last uh, The last line of that, just I just laughed out loud when I watched it the first time. Yeah. Remar what's a, the last line again? Uh, do you keep all your receipts? Yeah. I, unfortunately, we didn't all get to watch it while it, while our while our record. audience was seeing it, so we'll have to watch it together afterwards and laugh together. It was. Yeah, funny. I'm glad you laughed because that's it comes from kind of sarcasm. <laughs> I can me, tell I the humor. Tell. Humor helps <laughs> for me. Yeah. So that, that that's all I have to say for now. Is that's kind of me or what I wanted to say in this for now. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Tina. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Christina Pitaluga, AKA Tina, I go by that. Um, I mainly am a multimedia artist and actress, stylist, maker person. Um, I could l name a really long list, but then it's kind of like, I'm gonna just say maker person or creative <laughs> because it can go on. Um, I started off um, not very artistic, like I went to Catholic school um, and I was one of the very few brown kids in Catholic school, so there wasn't a lot of exposure to the arts there. And seventh grade, I was able to be in a play and that kind of like, I stepped foot on stage and like there were people and I was like, oh, like that makes sense. That's, that's what's been like 
missing because I was very loud and just different, strange type thing. Um, then I found that and was encouraged to dive into that. And I did, and I ended up going to Denver, Sc Denver School of the Arts and majoring in theater. Once again, um, I was the only black girl in my class, so that, um, you know, I, I, it took me a while to figure out, like, oh, this curriculum is not made for me whatsoever. So I found, like, my calling of being an artist and being on stage, but something was lacking because I wasn't, like, I, I received a great education there, but it wasn't geared for a, a queer biracial person, like, at all. Um, and so I was lucky enough to find the Black Actors Guild my junior year of high school. Um, and they kind of introduced me to all kinds of things. They were like, hey, like you're good at these things, but there's so many other things to try. And um, once I was encouraged to write and to just do something with the energy I had in my fingers, I kind of figured out like, wow, there's so many other things for me because I knew being introduced to theater that I loved clothing, I loved styling, I loved costuming, all of that. So being able to um, implement that into, you know, I could write for something, but I could also be the stylist for an episode we were writing with the Guild. Like, it really opened up my eyes to see that I didn't have to be just a one-track artist. Um, and that meant a lot to me because I, my brain is everywhere. I do the most all the time. That's, that's like a thing. So being able to realize I didn't have to just isolate myself in one form kind of made me grow a lot because I was like, wow, I can, I can try these other things. Um, I've been a teaching artist before, uh, taught theater to uh, adults and children and high schoolers. That is a whole lot of fun, I miss that. And those opportunities haven't been as often now because of the pandemic. But um, that also really forced me to grow and made me realize like, wow, there's so much that can be taught and, and done through art, like dealing with traumas and mental illness. And that's something that's really near and dear to me is being able to talk about those things, especially as a woman of color and just in POC communities, mental illness and, and, and trauma, it, it's embedded and it's not talked about enough. Um, and that's what a lot of my artwork has to do with, is just processing trauma and realizing that art is a wonderful outlet for that. And kind of spreading the word, kind of like, hey, did you know this? That like, if you just kind of write it out and cry, that's art, one, if you didn't know, it could very well be art. And two, it's very therapeutic. So yeah, I've had a really long, crazy road for such a short life, but Right now I'm currently just making what I can, doing what I can, and um, I was just blessed to be a part of a reading for Tattered Cover um, and Emanci uh, Emancipation Theater. We did A Raisin in the Sun, and I was Benitha, but it was, it was a Zoom, I shouldn't say but, but it was just strange because we had such chemistry, and yet we, like, we couldn't be around each other. Um, but that was my most recent thing that I've, uh, I've, I've done. Um, last year I did, I was the creative director for a project called Are We Still Cool that really dove into masculinity in the uh, in POC communities and how uh, there's just so much weight put on men to present themselves a certain way and things have to be very masculine or you know you're not allowed to talk about your feelings and that didn't feel right to me so I, I kind of was like, hey, creative people that love me, y'all want to make some art and see if people, you know, if, if it resonates with people. And I was lucky enough that it did. And that started a lot of conversations, which is the main thing I want to do because you have to have conversations to start talking about mental illness and to just to start anything. It really takes just a conversation with anyone that can start so much. So yeah, I'm, I'm blessed to be here, happy to be here, and to just continue to be a creative maker person. Thank you for having me, and y'all are so cool, by the way. <laughs> this, this is the coolest panel ever. I've been really, really excited about this panel uh, for a while now, uh, ever since I figured out who all was gonna be on it. Um, it's really, I just wanna thank you all for being here and sharing uh, a little bit about your work with us. I do have some questions for us. Um, one is, you know, how has the last year impacted your work from the pandemic and being holed up? Um, and uh, the events of late spring, early summer surrounding the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all the protests that have gone since then, gone down since then. Um, what's the last year been like for you and how has it impacted things art making wise and you personally? You're looking at me. Should I'm I looking start? at you. I'm okay. looking at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Unless one of you guys really want to jump in. Um, I think for me, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm 
in a weird way, I'm grateful that I had the time to internalize what is happening, but also to have the time to be with myself. Um, it's kind of probably, everyone can probably attest to this, that it's hard to be with yourself at times and, and really understand like where you're at and what type of growth that has happened. So I think, um, you know, in talking to a lot of people, I think it's, it's, it's been a time to self-reflect and really have the ability to, to be with the self. And uh, for me, yeah, it, 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 you know, I've always been a spiritual guy. You know, I'm not religious or anything like that, but I think spirituality has been a part of my essence for, you know, all of our essence since the beginning of time. So, like, um, so for me, I delved in in that realm, like, pretty deep and, and really tried to, like, discover, like, you know, who I am, where I come from, and what my abilities are and what I'm going to do with those abilities. And so, like, I'm really appreciative of that because, like, um, I know at the beginning, like, it was a lot of, like, freak out. And, um, but I, I was able to fall back on this creative process that really kind of kept me sane in a way, even though I was kind of freaking out as well. But um, it, it was a little bit easier to, to have something to fall back on and spend my time doing. Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest, you know, in, in doing that, it, it's really helped me to get to this level. You know, I'm still at the beginning stage, I feel like, of my art career, but I feel like a lot of things have happened over the year. Um, a friend of mine, you know, he called me the other day and we were talking about like when this pandemic started, we had a conversation then and I talked about having this time to make art. And I actually had an art show in August and, um, and that's kind of what I was preparing for. And this was right, you know, um, the art show was scheduled obviously before the pandemic hit. So it was still a go. So I utilized that time to really kind of do different things that I've been wanting to do for so long, whether it become, you know, like images that I collected over time that I really wanted to paint mm -hmm. or to approach a painting in a certain way. I was finally able to do that, you know? And um, so in doing so, I feel like allowing myself to internalize, be with the self and get, you know, spiritually fit, I was able to get to this level. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunities that have come my way since. So, and it's only been a year and a lot of things have happened within that year and, and a lot of it has been um, revolving around the arts and um, the huge thing is working in Boulder, you know, to really create that platform for people, um, especially indigenous folks to, to have the ability to showcase what they can do. Um, and I don't mean showcase like to, you know, express their ego or anything. It's more or less to like allow them to, to, to feel engaged and supported and to um, educate non-native folks about who they are and where they come from. And, um, you know, when it comes to like the social aspect of things, you know, it, it was no surprise to have that all happen. I feel like a lot of that is still happening. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's America, you know, it's, it's, it's America's way of handling and doing things. And it's what, unfortunate. What do you mean by the social thing? Um, I, when you talked about like the George Floyd, yeah. you know, the uprisings and the okay. different things that were happening racially, right. Right. Um, you know, I grew up in a small town that was very kind of, um, it was very bad. You know, there's a book called The Broken Circle. If you guys are interested, take a, you know, look into that. And um, so, you know, I mean, it, it's something that I, you know, in a way, like you're, you're used to it, but you don't want to be used to it. And, um, and, and, and I don't want to just be like accepting like, oh yeah, that's just America. Like I said earlier, um, you know, so for me it was okay. Like how, how can I relate to folks and really bring the humanity back? Mm -hmm. And I, I like what you said earlier about like having a conversation with people, um, and, and really kind of sharing space with one another just to talk things out. Even if it's not about race, just really kind of getting to the heart of everything and really relating as human beings and how we're no different from one another, but we just carry ourselves differently. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's so huge in developing conversations because that's how relationships are started and built. Even though we may not agree on everything, there's that common humanity that allows us to kind of grow together mm -hmm. and, 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 and try to make things better in some fashion. And, um, and to me, that means a lot, you know, and, and, and I feel like in doing art and really 
building those relationships like I am now since I just moved to the Boulder area like in October. There's a lot of conversations happening around art, and I'm so grateful for that. You know, whether they're with natives or non-native folks, you know, it's so great to finally um, share space with people who, who have the common goal and interest of what we want to do to make the future better for this country. And, 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 and I'm really honored and grateful that it's with the arts. Yeah. And um, so, you know, and, and that's kind of how it's been happening for me. So, you know, like, yeah, uh, in a weird way, I'm grateful it happened. So COVID has been a productive, mm -hmm. a productive time for you and a reflective time. Oh yeah, for, for sure. Well. Yeah. Anybody else? I mean, I think there was a lot of pressure on on people in general to make use of this time, um, you know, and uh, you know, I, maybe more more um, more pressure on creatives to be productive at this time. Were you all productive, or did some of you just work on a big indentation on their? <laughs> well, it's interesting that you bring up the word productivity because, you know, that's something that I, again, examine in terms of a sociological perspective, in terms of when I hear productivity, I, I obviously like to be productive, but I also think of how can you make a profit or what are you doing that proves that you exist? What are you doing that, that what are you, how are you contributing? What are you, how are you fitting into the system that's constructed and that's nothing wrong with that it's just how it is at the moment and again that's me examining well me saying that's just how it is what does that mean as well too maybe i should say creatively generative yeah i mean i'm not <laughs> saying that there's a bad word to use or we shouldn't use the word it's just interesting yeah. that uh you're not the only one who's brought that up because i have a luthier friend who i'm working on building the bases with and yesterday he was talking about productivity as well too we had a similar conversation uh but to go to your point um uh, from 2014 to about 2019, I was dealing with some pretty severe chronic health issues that uh, enabled me uh, or disabled me to be able to um, produce anything. I really could barely talk. I was couldn't really sing. It then in turn affected the rest of my body and became a very chronic thing for about five years. You know, doctors and physical therapy and specialists and injections and many, sco many scopes and all these different things. And so... Health for me was something that I was very conscious of prior to COVID. And March 14th rolled around in 2019, I believe. Uh, no, 2020. Yeah, 2020. As it's all these years, 19, 20, 21. Like, <laughs> yeah. when, when, did this, when did it happen? <laughs> so yeah, it was March 14th, 2020 at the Mercury Cafe was one of my first performances since all of this that I just mentioned happened. I was finally able to crawl out of this trans to this transition of mine and this transformation and it finally able to have the confidence to go up on stage and do it. So I had all these people invited. You know, I was working at the Denver Art Museum at the time, you know, networking there. And it was that Saturday and that's when they announced, you know, stay home. This thing's coming. We don't know what it is. Be ready. Mm -hmm. And so the whole show itself, uh, which will be released pretty soon, hopefully, once my... my uh, one of my people that I work with finishes it up. The whole show was dealing with the concept of doom, something apocalyptic coming. And it started off with, you know, Mall of America commercial back in the 80s. Then it went into this Oh Beautiful, which is a different, you know, thing of the Star Spangled Banner. And then it went into this other song about the meat packaging industry. Mm -hmm. Then it had another song called This is a Pig, which is about, which was about police brutality. So all these things that I did, I'm not saying I'm a seer or anything like that, but it just, it was so weird that I came up with this little show. Mm -hmm. And I had another song about Trump as well, too. And I started it off with this monologue from V for Vendetta, the film, called Power of a Pathogen. And it's about how the government, in this fictional world, V for Vendetta, developed this, this thing and released it to the public and used it to reelect the dictator in this fictional world. So I tried to use that as well to mold, you know, science fiction to reality. But it was just strange because my mind was already there in the sense, because my mind, as I said, nihilistic perspective or this, I don't know, this realistic perspective of like just seeing things how they are. I just try to just to analyze them that way. So going into that with all those things that I mentioned and then COVID happening, the number one thing for me was like, okay, so my health was already at risk. I got a taste of what it's like to have my life completely crippled. Here's another thing that could happen 
that I could get that affects respiratory and who knows what else will happen to me. So that paranoia obviously sunk in for a while and to some degree still does. So using this time to kind of reflect on that, I just kept making the things I was already doing because all this stuff I really like, you know, Pink Floyd, you know, Porcupine Tree, Stephen Wilson, a lot of these people are dystopic in their sonic realms, Nine Inch Nails, again, this industrial, you know, um, kind of thing, this punk approach. I was already and still am kind of tenacious and aggressive in the sense of how I present myself theatrically. So I don't know, I guess what I'm saying is I was almost kind of ready mm -hmm. in the sense that I didn't want to be ready, but just to see the empty streets and to see the places that I love to hang out with clothes or just be gone. I was so used to that already for the five years of like, oh, you can't do that anymore, can't do that anymore. That part of you is gone. So losing all of that and seeing it happen to everybody else kind of in that way, I was like, wow, this is interesting just to be part of it. And fortunate you know, enough that I was able to get grants because of the wonderful support in the mm. art community. I've been, able, I've been able to pay my bills and you know, invest a little into my productions and stuff as well too. So it's been a blessing, but also just a frustration as well too. But mm -hmm. I know it hasn't been a blessing for everybody else. And I'm not saying that it is a blessing. That's not even the right word. Right. It's Silver just, lining. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I'm so used to being compromised. And so here's another thing to compromise me. And I, like I said, I was so used to it. I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna have to learn how to live stream. I'm gonna have to start making films. Cause I was so against live streaming to begin with when I first started, cause like, no, I'm immersive. You have to be in person. You have to see me live. And now I'm like, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> you have all, yeah, right. I had yeah. all this equipment that was for live purposes, but then I've been able to transform that into, you know, being streaming. Mm. So again, adaptation, it's taught me, cause again, all those five years taught me how to adapt, how to change my voice, how to improve it, how to express myself differently. Because prior to that, I was more of a metal singer, grunge singer, more of a, like a snarl. But now it's much more, excuse me, um, smooth jazz and um, spoken word. Mm -hmm. So I learned that I didn't have to yell and I'm more to be heard. Mm -hmm. I can create this sonic field that kind of sucks you in. Mm -hmm. And I can almost just whisper mm -hmm. and you still still get your attention. So, yeah, I mean, and then again, to go in into the political circle and the um, protests and the movements that we've seen, it's beautiful to see that historically happen again. I very much have studied the 60s and 70s and all those political movements and MLK and Malcolm X and all those forth runners um, who have created those organizations. It's nice to see that come again, you know? And I think it's also important to bring up again, even what happened this week, you know, in terms of seeing, you know, racially driven hate crimes and to see this political leader, you know, Trump for the last four years, continuously divide this country and use the ignorance of a lot of people's perspective to fuel his agenda. Mm -hmm. And again, that's something that I examine very much so in the work that I do. And it's disheartening and it's frustrating, but it's also just nice to see people, some people just understand that something is broken mm -hmm. and we need to address this in all different angles. It's, it, it's about race, gender, you know, capitalism, consumerism, everything needs to be re-examined in the systems. You know, the common thing, the anarchist approach would just to be say to just destroy it or just annihilate it completely. And that could be the case, but we need to have a backup plan <laughs> to what's could to come next. Cause I think people are still trying to fix a system that has already been broken since the dawn of the nation. It was built on slavery and genocide. Mm -hmm. And we need to address that, put it in the history books teach our children, have the dialogue, like you were saying in the conversation, and there will be friction and consequence and actions from that, but we still need to have the conversation. Oh, and also I went to Denver School of the Arts as well. <laughs> gang, gang. So, uh, but yeah, and I like what you said. It's nice to hear that uh, other people had a similar experience. Not bad, but not really good either. So, exactly. but yeah, but that's to answer the question. <laughs> you know, to follow up on, on what COVID is, what, co what this last year has done to us, it seems like, whenever we're faced with a major disruption in our lives and routines, we're presented with an opportunity for reflection and change. Mm -hmm. um, the world hasn't seen a uh, disruption of such epic, epic proportions in a very long time. And I'm wondering if you think that COVID, I, I almost actually, I almost wonder if um, the response to George Floyd's death 
would have had the same impact had we not been within a pandemic. You know what I mean? I feel like it, it opened, it cracked something open and we were open to things that we weren't open previously, open to previously. I would love to speak on that because yeah. that's actually something that yeah. uh, I was really frustrated with when everything like went all across the world and there, there were protests and everything. I already, first of all, dealing with police brutality and everything, that's like a, a daily thing I hear about and deal with even within my own family. So it was kind of like, for me, it was kind of like, oh, now you're listening? Like now you're listening because you're bored. And I struggled with that for weeks where it was like, I personally had been immuno immunocompromised and had to stay in the house anyway. And I normally was someone that would be on the front lines and be out there and be ready. But I'd been to plenty of protests and I've been screaming at the top of my lungs for like my whole life. And the fact that it took for everybody to be bored in the house, in the house bored, and then you know videos are released like they've been. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, now, now you care. Now you're hearing what we've been saying for how many years? Hundreds of years? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, and so it was almost like, I don't know, and it seemed like a lot of my, like, my allies wanted like a pat on the back for it. And for me, that was also kind of like a, I, I'm not going to cuss or nothing, but it was really kind of <laughs> like a, what are you talking, like, I'm not going to give you a pat on the back because I've been calling out for this action for so long. And now because you have nothing else to do and you're itching to get out of the house, you're going to go down to the Capitol and you're going to make a sign and you're going to be like, woo, I'm making a difference. But really, you just were itching to get out because those same people are now quiet about what happened this week. <laughs> and it's just very ironic and strange. So that's something I clearly still deal with uh, shadiness and struggles um, because there's been a lot of performative activism that has not sat right with me at all. Um, but I definitely think it would be different. It would have been different. It would have been the same thing as like, he would have been a hashtag and it would have just been, okay, two weeks from now, oh my gosh, now somebody's getting divorced and that's what people care about. And I don't think it would have been as much of a deal if people hadn't have been itching to leave out of their homes because there were people that were literally leaving and acting like it was a kiki, like people were going to like party. And it's like, no, you understand that like, my brother could just die and be murdered by law enforcement. That's a reality I deal with every day. It's not like, and you're just going out because like, oh my gosh, people are bringing white claws in their backpacks and you're ready to like say fuck the man, excuse my language. <laughs> but like, it just, it didn't sit right with me. And, and, and I'm not trying to sound bitter or anything, but also uh, take, take it how you want. It just didn't, it, it didn't sit right with me. So it's very interesting that you brought up that question because that was something I was gonna bring up in the fact that like, yeah, it was very inspirational that happened all over the world. But at the same time, the timing of it was all very interesting and, and sketchy to me because I was just like, it, why did it take for everybody to be so bored for you to show up? Well, I, a lot of people are saying, you know, this time it's different. Mm. Is, is it Sorry. different this time, you think? Oh, God. Yeah. What's, what defines different? I mean, like, right. lasting, are people, so it's like people heard. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. people, somehow, somehow what happened to George Floyd and, and, and to a lesser degree with Breonna Taylor People, people received it, felt it in a way that they hadn't received it or felt it previously, some people, maybe, right. maybe people like me. Um, and people are saying, well, you know, this, this has changed people. This, those people who heard or felt it have been changed. Right. Um, and so therefore, you know, we really can make, you know, we can, we can make progressive change. We can move things forward. I think that we have to harness that outrage and passion systemically. Mm. Like right now, people's rights to vote are being dismantled hands down, like in Georgia. And that's just where we are paying attention to it. This is happening across the board, you know? So I, I really appreciate, you know, what you were sharing because um, I found it inspiring and troubling, like at once. And I feel that we have to um, kind of abandon some of our na naivete mm -hmm. around systems of power and like be willing to put in the agonizing work of contributing to that kind of change. Because I think like correcting people's language is essential because um, language is a tool through which we make meaning in how we interpret the world. And also, I don't care if people speak politely to me or don't use slurs. I care that they stop killing people. I care that there are consequences for when there's harm. 
I mm. care that there's accountability and transparency in our government and that they stop lying. So to me, those things require the agonizing effort of pushing against bureaucracy um, that just is designed to slow things down so that our tension shifts. So I feel that there is a moment here that we have and I feel like we're, we're seeing some of that happen, but I, I think that we have to really think con concretely about our commitment to civil society, which isn't a term you hear very much now, period. But we have to contribute, you know, we have to participate. I don't think that we can just break things I don't think that we can build alternatives wholesale from the ground up. We have to work incrementally in, a t in tandem with these other visions for society, for, for how we engage one another, for how we think about our resources and our relationships to the world and to one another. Those things have to happen like in tandem, you know? So I feel like with the artists out here, like I love the arts because I think it's a way to, I love this, the people here on the stage because they're engaging in transforming imaginations and community from the inside, you know, from the feeling, from inspiration, from how we dream. And also that, that, that moves throughout the community in different ways, but we also need those folks who are the activists who can encourage people to do something and do the unsexy thing, like show up to be on the town council, mm -hmm. run for office, flyer, get your friends to vote, register, pay attention to how districts are drawn. Like those are the not sexy things where you don't get credit for taking a selfie. You know what I mean? Like you have to, you have to work up at that. And um, just back to your question about productivity and I really appreciated Cipriano how you were like, hmm, let's interrogate that a little bit. Cause I do feel like we live in a culture of overwork and it, and of performing like our productivity, which keeps us in a state of exhaustion and distraction. So we're not actually focused on these conversations that are happening like at City Hall or you know what I mean, where we don't have the attention for it. And it's often very technical. So we need support to even like engage in listening thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, I feel like we need the both, you know, and I'm kind of unusual in that I'm a little bit in both worlds mm -hmm. and, um, I just want to point out the human cost for folks of color who are engaged in that work. I think a lot of times like our leadership is like really lauded, but I don't think people acknowledge like the psychological human cost it is to us to bear that for the community and to have to educate people and come up with solutions and like push people along. That is, we, that leadership is required. And also like we need, so, we need more support, you know, we need more care. We need more um, just emotional resources to do that for the long haul. Like I'm amazed at some folks like John Lewis who passed. How does someone do that in the seat of government, which is frankly like the worst machine ever to possibly engage in because there's no real win. There's only compromise. So how do you do that for that long? I don't know, you know, like that's to me where I feel like we have to, the arts are a place of regeneration where we can like support each other um, thoughtfully. But I think like the work is like, we have to commit to it. Mm. Wow, thank you. Um, so, um, it, it does seem like it's a, it's a time of, of, of great possibility, mm. but that possibility, but not just positive possibility. It just is a time of like, anything can happen like the best things and the absolute worst things at the same time. Yeah, I think the storming of the Capitol is a pretty good example of the possibility of another world that we, another world that exists that I don't think any of us really know about in the sense that we don't immerse ourselves in fascism. Uh, we don't want a world like that, but it's clearly there is a possibility and there still is a possibility, I think four years from now, maybe even sooner that that could happen again. The threat of real fascism and the threat of real just pure evil. Mm. You know, what happened with the storming of the Capitol for me, when I mean, you just brought up possibility, that just shows me a possibility of a very dark world that I think we've almost got a pretty good taste of with the Trump administration. But also to go on to your uh, fact of like, basically you were saying what I was saying, like I was already here. I was already like, hello, <laughs> right. like, do you not see this all the time? 
And it, it's interesting that you interpret it as, and I want to honor what you say because I believe it's true. It is partially boredom. I saw it the same way of like, you're just all bored. That's your excuse is you want to get out. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a huge motivation. But I also see it as well too is like um, everybody was so exhausted all the time because nine to five having multiple jobs, you know, and how we all know as artists especially. So we didn't have time to think. And I think social media, that's a whole other conversation, is, a, is evil and good in the sense of like it showed people right on their screens like this tenacious, terrible acts that happen over and over, yeah. uh, historically as well too. So yeah, it's, it's interesting that you said, I just wanted to honor what you were saying. I was like, thank you. Because mm -hmm. it was like, that's, I was like, because my, my music, as I said, you know, that whole set list that I did before the pandemic even started, it was like, these are real issues. Yeah. You know, and they're never going to go away until we just do what you were saying, is find the unsexy things. And the only way to beat the system is to understand the system. That's another thing this whole thing taught me. Like, I really don't understand how my government works. Mm. And that really made me feel really stupid. Like, I don't, I complain about the system, the system, capitalism. It's like, well, yeah, but let's find out the inner work. Because I like to take things apart mm -hmm. physically anyway. So I want to understand it more and more. And it's shown me that I need to do my research. You know, and I need to have conversations and find people who are, who understand it better than I do, you know? So I just wanted to say all that, so, yeah. Also, sorry, just to bring it back to how you were asking about if things were different, I mean, let's look at how things went with, with the cases of the murderers of these people. It, are things different? Not really, so it's kind of like, ah, even after everybody has had this awakening, we're still getting the same outcome. So what do we do? And it's it's so much about like from the inside out. And it just and people keep saying that, but it's because it's true. Yeah, it we true. have to change the system. We are not happy with it. We have to change it. And it's been made very difficult for us to change and make for people that look like us. Because it certainly one hundred percent is not. Yeah. So it's designed, how do it's we designed that way? Yeah. Right. How how do you do that? Like yeah. how? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Does anybody know? No. Right. I and mean, I yeah. One thing I wanted to just mention, and I don't know like how you all feel about this, but I think we have to be honest about our reliance on white allies. Mm. Yeah. You know, I'm a Korean American in Denver. I'm a 0.3% <laughs> of the population, you know, like me, me advocating on behalf of like the uh, fighting anti-Asian bias and discrimination, like I need coalition. I need other folks of color. I need the white majority, mm. people from the white majority to like, participate and care. So I feel strongly about like spaces that are dedicated to only folks of color and like, you know, uh, for regeneration, for safety. But I also feel very powerfully that we have to be honest about the fact that like, I think we need to sometimes have more patience and be willing to work with folks who maybe don't talk about things the same way I do, mm. or who, um, you know, present things in the their version of reality is that maybe odds and like rubs up against mine, but we have a shared value of like our core humanity. Mm. So we, you know what I mean? Like I feel like we need to kind of like dive into that a little bit. Um, and I just mentioned that because I feel like there's less patience for conflict or disagreement. Um, our stamina for it is poor. And if there's one thing I think we need, it's actual dialogue, you know, and a capacity to sit with people who say things that sound upsetting to me, but to understand the worldview that led them to those statements and to also understand that we have something essential that's like shared there. And I think that art is like the soft diplomacy that helps us do that, you know? Like mm. I was struck, I got the chance to look at some of the work you all do and I was just struck by how beautiful all of it was in so many different ways. And like that's, I think what you were speaking to JC before about like that spirituality, that like finding that connection with one another, I feel like that's a requirement. You know, that doesn't always happen in political discourse, but the arts can be like the way that help us get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think like, you know, I wanna add to you saying about like coalition and working with other organizations for the same effort to make everything equal as much mm -hmm. as possible. Um, it has to be genuine too. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be sincere yeah. and it has to be not trendy and not for the selfie because that's what we live with right now and i feel like it's just it's just an opportunity to feel like oh yeah i'm i'm, I'm doing something for the moment but i i feel like people have to be in it for the long haul too because and, it, and it's not pretty 
and it, and it gets stressful and it's depressing and it's taxing on your physical and mental well-being. And, and I think, you know, for us to really have some sort of change, everybody has to be invested as much as possible. And, um, you know, because like for me, like you said about the whole thing about people were finally showing up, it was almost like, but everybody wasn't showing up for that reason too. Like you said, they were bored and they're like, this is an opportunity for me to just go wreak havoc and destroy yeah. some yeah. stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a whole capital, the, the, the storming of the capital is the same thing, you know? It's just, it was just like a bunch of grown kids and it's like, you know, I mean, that's not what we need and that's not what we want. We want mature individuals who really want to see change for the better and not just for the moments of time. And, um, and it's huge because like, you know, for me, it, it's just ironic that a lot of what our people are experiencing, you know, the minority population, if you will, um, it's just, it's almost like we've come full circle. Like you said things about learning from the 60s. It's almost the 60s again. Yeah. You know, we're living that. And it's a repeat. And it's like, how, how many times do we have to watch the same episode or, you know, can, can Netflix update what we're watching, <laughs> you know, because like it, it's, it's, uh, it's horrible to see us having to still talk about how do we create change, yeah. you know, and, and because it's, it's a little disappointing because it's almost like we've been trying to help you get there and develop an answer or go in that direction so we don't have to do this again. And, um, and we're still trying to give answers. We're still tr trying to provide solutions to what is happening. And, um, you know, and it's just sad because, like, you know, I mean, for me, you know, and seeing what my people went through, and like I said, the 60s was huge for all of our, you know, different ethnic backgrounds. You know, I mean, and, it, and it's, it's just disappointing to see that all happen again and still continue in 2020. One, you know, and, 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 um, and if, you know, and I think it's up to, again, I mean, I don't know, I, I guess I should speak for myself. It's up to me to work with the youth as much as possible to support them and really understand like, hey, you know, things do have to change. How do we do that together? And if they don't want to listen to us, how do we just keep continuing no matter what? Um, because the struggles and challenges will possibly continue as we're seeing. And um, we just got to help each other build up the strength and the endurance to keep running, you know, and, and, and make it not about a race, but definitely a marathon so everyone can celebrate and, and, and really feel good about where we're living and what we're doing here. And, and I think, you know, for me, again, like I said, you know, with this, these artistic endeavors that I've been um, Going on, you know, it, it's it's a uh, it's nice to see that there there are a lot of ethnic backgrounds being represented in that, and and sometimes I'm just like, dang, I wish everyone could just be an artist, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. What what role we're gonna we're gonna just one more question here, and then we're gonna go uh, and move on to Q and A. So if you're watching on Facebook, uh, feel free to plug a question into the chat and we'll get to you. Um, the last question, I guess, is, uh, you know, what, what is the role of institutions in this? Uh, you know, specifically uh, museums and cultural institutions in terms of uh, moving things forward and uh, offering greater opportunities for, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusivity. I, um, for me, I've worked with different museums and institutions and in both taken classes and also been an instructor and a TA and an intern. Uh, mainly at Arvada Center of the Arts and Humanities, but also did some work uh, as a gallery host at the Denver Art Museum, and now I'm here. So, uh, so I can mainly just speak from my own perspective, which is the best <laughs> to base this off of. Um, my first reaction to that question is museums need to be honest. They need to not glorify or fetishize the people that they're representing in the history that they're trying to bestow upon the people that go in to visit the museums. Mm -hmm. There should be more exhibits to talk about historical problems, whether that's you know genocide or whether that's et cetera. Because for me, as seeing indigenous stuff represented, I've had to teach, you know, I taught corn husk dolls at the Arvada Center. 
okay? And that's a great class, it's, a, it's very fun. <laughs> uh, but never once in the curriculum, it's like, let's mention what happened to the mm. people who made these things. Mm. You know, the colonial, the colonization, the pilgrims didn't just come and we had Thanksgiving and it was all great. It wasn't that. So every time I taught that class, I was like, okay, kids, imagine you just finished making this doll and you know, you have all your toys and you know, you have this house and you have, or you have this village or you have this community. Imagine somebody coming into that and being like, this is mine now. All this land here, all these resources, everything that you believe in is gone. It's wrong. You're, you're not even human. I didn't say that to the students, but you know that's basically what I wanted to do. What I'm saying is these institutions start need to start. I love institutions, Museum of Nature and Science, the Smithsonian, you know, uh, all these museums that I've been to around the world because I'm fortunate enough to uh, my parents have taken me there, and I love them, you know. But I just see, you know, how I mean, John Basquiat comes to mind as well too of just how, you know, they loved him, but you know, he's his work is primitive. Mm -hmm. You know, so look at the primitive person creating these things. So it's again, or like even traditional pottery, it's like, that's all we can do. And I love traditional pottery. I love all the traditional stuff, very much so. But let's, we can, let's just find a balance, you know, just, just be honest and do things like this and be like, this is an institution. An institution can either hold up what's just being the consistent status quo or it can disrupt things. And I think, and disrupt things in a positive direction. Mm -hmm just again, to have conversation. And I think our society just doesn't know how to deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to films, you know, Taxi Driver, one comes to mind for me, like the character Travis Bickle is a war veteran, you know, is in poverty and goes on a shooting rampage mm -hmm. and is seen as a hero because of the circumstances. But my point is most people will be like, that guy's crazy. But me, I see it like, no, he's a result of mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think that's, why we need to just start questioning these things is to just see we we deal with conflict in such a guttural way as americans it's just we just resort to violence it's mm -hmm. like we either disagree and we agree to disagree we don't talk or we just we just fight and you know i think we need to understand how to deal with conflict and i call it friction mm -hmm. i don't call it conflict because i i've been in martial arts i've had my toe-to-toe -to -toe experiences with physical bouts mm -hmm. and i've studied martial arts extensively to understand that point of view of why do we go to that point of view. For me, physical violence and destroying something is the last resort at this point. And I think that's not for everybody. And it's sad that people think that only, the only way to express themselves is to kill people or is to find a minority group or find a group of people. It doesn't have to be a minority group, just a group of people and kill them, just to be heard. And I think that's really what it comes down to is people want to be heard and their form of expression is violence. And if they can find out that that's not the only way to express oneself, and it's art. And like you said, I think everybody is an artist because everybody is emotive, and it's not like putting a parse to the paint or it's not even writing a poem. Sometimes it's just moving differently mm -hmm. or thinking differently. All we're doing as artists is we're showing people, what if you look at it this way? You know. So that's, I think, how, and then institutions, in turn, to come back to the question, should display those things mm -hmm. and show those things and just be honest and just give the pedestal to those people, you know, and just try to be as open as you can, so. Yeah. Keanu, I loved everything you just said. Oh, <laughs> I, sure. I just wanna say amen. And also, I think too, when it comes to like language, you know, like even the word status quo, it hides the violence. Mm. It hides the violence. So I feel like just being honest and also like museums and institutions, they make thought, they create the narrative that the public then adopts as like our version of reality. So they, don't, they hold incredible power in creating consensus and creating a sense of like what even is our national story or what is this place. And um, I think it's important for the people who wield power in those roles to just speak upfront about what they don't know. Know that they don't know some things and bring in other people <laughs> to fill in the dots for what they don't know, you know. Um, maybe hire more so that more people have different knowledge so that more people can see it together they don't know, you know, <laughs> like, and just like change a little bit the narrative around how we even think about curation, whose stories to uplift and why. I feel like that's a, something too that these institutions can like do a little bit better. Yeah, I think, yeah, oh. go ahead. Uh, I, back to what I was saying earlier about just like curriculum, so much of it has to do with that because I feel like if everybody were learning these things that 
me as a, a 23 going on 24 year old, I'm learning things from my niece who's currently in college. She's taking a Asian American experience class. And sometimes like I just call her on like FaceTime and sit there and listen because I'm like, I don't know things. And so much of that is because we're just not being taught it. Like I didn't realize I was taught primarily just white history till I was like, 18 or 19 and I was like hold up like why don't I know anything about anything that has to do with anything that looks like me like it and my my other POC friends had the same questions and I just feel like if we were to start from a young age if you would have said that at the corn husk doll making like they probably it probably would have rocked their world but also if you introduce those things from a younger age in a curriculum I think people will start to refuse accepting just one version of things and and yeah and also coming back around to having more contemporary and newer things and being like hey this isn't just in the past like there are currently people of color making art that is super dope and it's not all just corn husk and pottery and things of that nature it's so important but a uh, curriculum I think is one of the biggest ways institutions could could kind of fix and brush up on things is just making an inclusive curriculum. And it it's crazy that that sounds so difficult. Why why does that sound like, oh, inclusivity? <laughs> like, what? I don't understand. Like, literally, everybody should be required to have an African American studies class, an indigenous studies class. Like, all of those should be required, no question. Like, when you get to college, now you get to learn about that. But you're already, you've already been exposed. If you're an indigenous person, you've already been exposed to all this stuff. And you know these things, then you're around people who have no idea what's going on. So just curriculum is, like, the top thing, I think. Yeah, and, and I think... Um the, the other thing is also being okay with the fear of changing things mm -hmm. yeah. as an institution. I think they're afraid of making it different because people are so used to that. And, 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 and like, I like what you said about really updating these museums and really showing people different things because I feel like sometimes those stereotypes of what the people are, are developed from that. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how I want you to perceive them because this is what they've made and that's probably how they perceive themselves. And also some of this stuff is just not necessarily art, it's also a utilitarian thing. It's something they use to survive mm -hmm. and how it relates to them is even deeper than how they're presenting it, you know? And, and it's also about repatriation too, you know, about yeah. giving some of this stuff back to where they came from, how it was looted and taken and stolen just for them to show, you know? And, and that's, you know, being honest he too, yeah. huge, you know, especially with indigenous folks, a lot of this stuff was like grave robbed. Yep. And, and now it's like, oh, I, I found it, so now it's mine. Really, it's not, you know? And I feel like, you know I mean, for me, and, and really relieving the pain and developing those relationships, allowing the people to have these things back and to really um, address them in a, in, a, in a certain way, whether it be ceremonial or just presenting them differently, um, would impact people differently and, and really create the change that we're looking for when it comes to the arts. So, you know, I mean, and, and yes, hugely, just being honest about it, you know, being honest about how you got these things. You know, it wasn't like, yeah, bro, you can take that. It's yours, you know, like really being like, yeah, we stole that mm -hmm. and it's not really ours. Yeah. You know, it's just somebody who took it and said it was theirs. And, and I feel like that's kind of also building those relationships and allowing people of color to speak about these things, too, because they know more about the experience and have the lived experience of what they mean. And, and, and can really present it in a way that's more effective than just seeing it behind a glass. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really exploring that in that way so people can understand like, okay, I get it now. Mm -hmm. And I do agree it should go back with you, mm -hmm. you know? So that's my thing on that. Yeah, and I think that's happening more and more these days. I think mm -hmm. institutions are beginning to catch up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I know that we have, the Lawmont Museum here has a, uh, a permanent exhibition called Front Range Rising that really kind of charts the development of this region. And it's a, it's a warts and all kind of mm -hmm. um, exhibition. And yeah. you know, we take kids through it all the time and mm -hmm. uh, they learn about you know, what happened here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're also in the process of, I mean, we're also in the process of having, working with a, a native person on developing a, um, uh, uh, what, what do we call it? Uh, remind me the, it's a uh, statement. It's a... Uh, land acknowledgement? <laughs> land acknowledgement, mm -hmm. thank mm. you very much. Um, which is very, pow I, I find very powerful and it's something we'll be saying mm -hmm. uh, before a lot of programs. Right. Um, just, you know, recognizing that, you know, 
we weren't here first, and mm -hmm. there were people here before us, and they're still here among us, right. and uh, to respect and to remind our even our children of that. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I'm cool with land acknowledgement, but yeah. I also have my guff with that. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. You, yeah, well, it's, it's almost because the land acknowledgement, yeah, it's cool and everything, but it's like the people are still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost still talking about them like, yeah, they were here, oh. but now here, here we are telling you they used to be here. Oh, so I think we that's got to be part that. of it. That's yeah. got to be part of it. Yeah, yeah. it's like also like you let them know like, yeah, they're down the street. Mm -hmm. Go say what's <laughs> up. Or they're right here. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I think, you know, I think part of the answer to kind of bridging the divide here is, you know, make more art, uh, consume more art, um, because there's something about it I was just thinking of like, you know, there was a certain president that I abhorred, a certain George W. And I just despised him, you know, as a young progressive wacko dude, arty guy. <laughs> and, uh, and then one day I, I discovered that the guy, you know, he's no longer president and he's painting. And I looked at his paintings and I thought, I love this guy. <laughs> I can't even believe it. I don't, I don't even, this, I don't, all of a sudden he was like, the most lovable ex-president ever. I mean, there was something, I, it was evidence that he was looking at the world. Mm -hmm. He was in conversation with the world and uh, it, in a very direct way. And he was, he was uh, there was some humility in putting his work out there uh, for people to see. And I just, I, that kind of sat well with me. That doesn't mean that there were, there were weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq or anything, um, <laughs> but uh, it really humanized him for me and was uh, enabled me to kind of see him as more of a, a human being than just this this president guy that I didn't like at all. Anyway. It's kind of like Jim Carrey when he started painting. Yeah. Too. No, it's not like that, actually. It's not like that at all. That's different. Well, that's <laughs> that's different. a little different. Jim Carrey and George anyway. Bush. Yeah, right. Jim, yeah. Jim Carrey <laughs> playing George Bush. I don't know, you know, I, Jim, I stick that. to acting. I just, I think you should stick to acting. Sorry. Um, anyway, I'm, let me see if... Uh, um, let me see if there are any questions in here. There are lots of comments. Uh, good job, Cipriano. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Well, thank, you uh, very much. thank you all for the honest and open conversation. We need more conversations like this. This is a great conversation. I'm loving it. Agree so much. Watching nothing change is hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Living it is even harder. We must come together for change, says Mar Martha. Oh, Pitaluga. Hi, Aww. Mama. <laughs> hey there, girl. Shout out to the mothers. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, too. Anyway. Justin, while you're looking at those comments, just one thing I wanted to say, too, was, like, creativity. Yes. I think, um, why is that sequestered to childhood? Mm. You know, I think that, like, all of us as adults in this world benefit so much from our creative practice and how it deepens our humanity and our ability to see one another and move a little bit more ethically or kindly or thoughtfully or respectfully in the world. And we can feel like we're contributing, you know? Um, it's really heartbreaking to me because I used to work out as an art college professor. It's very heartbreaking to me that like the ways that we can be adults now is to consume things, mm -hmm. like consume art, consume food, consume entertainment, but we're very rarely offered or invited into making, creating, even gathering together to do things, mm -hmm. to make. And I just think that there's something about this that we need to investigate, which I would hope that a lot of this pandemic has maybe created opportunity for, like for people to like craft again, to like make. I, I'm so grateful for like um, the music industry because I enjoy music so much. And at the same time, I feel like even what we do sometimes as artists can make art feel remote or unattainable for folks when it's being done at a certain level or a certain conversation. I, th I just wish that there were more resources for adults to access these things and for it to not be considered like hobbyists, but to really be like an essential component of just what it is to be like a functioning human. You know, like you make money, you take care of the people you, lo you love and you make things. Like I feel like that should, that why, why is this well, just Yeah, just creation you know? and innovation in general. Yeah, that's yeah. what's driven our species to where we are now. I mean, with yeah. everything that's around us. That's another thing that COVID really reminded me of is like, you know, wow, I can just take all my clothes and push a button and they're mm -hmm. clean. And I can push another button, they're dry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I push another button. Well, you got to take them out you know, of the, yeah. Unless <laughs> you have a combo. Unless oh, you have one yeah, of those combos. There is, there's still yeah. the physical labor. But yeah. my point is, is like, 
this, this, this machine was driven through innovation and frustration. Mm -hmm. People are like, I don't want to wash my clothes in the river and it's cold and I have to scrub, you know, like. So through that frustration, that's creativity. Mm -hmm. What the problem is, is that we've capitalized on that and we've wanted to just make everything a product. How can we make money off mm -hmm. of this? Versus like, well, this is what I feel like. I can work with wood or I can work with paint or I can work with food or work with wor words. It's, it's just, it's just being innovative and being creative, like you're saying. And, and, and craft, for us as artists, like when somebody says, oh, that's a nice craft, it's kind of a dirty word yeah. in our world, but I still like that word because I, I like, I, the, during this pandemic, I've been fortunate enough to be able to use recycled woods and create bases, mm -hmm. you know? And like working with a luthier who has 30 plus years experience in music as well. And just to have that experience, like I was like, wow, I just wish more people could have that. Not mess, maybe not in that genre, but just like, you know, everybody has an interest. Mm -hmm. And whether it's creative or not, or seen as creative or not, I think it still is creative. Or there's mm -hmm. a way to make it that you're not just being passive, but active mm -hmm. in whatever it is that you enjoy. Whether it's film, video games, or whatever. It's like, well, if you like video games, maybe make a video game, or et cetera, you know? Or if that's too unattainable, then just start drawing. I don't know, you know? I'm just trying to say, like, it's not unattainable, you know, not trying to quote Nike either, but just do it, you know? <laughs> I mean, just like, you know? I have a, an electrical outlet tattooed to my bicep, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, you know, and that's, it's, it's important to have an outlet. That's why I've got it, you know? Um, You're the conduit. I'm, I'm dedicated to, to output. Anyway, this is part of my creative, pra my kind of creative practice. Um, public programs and these kind of dialogues, and I really want to thank you all for participating and and you know having a little fun with me too tonight. I really appreciate it. And you guys are welcome back anytime, anytime. Just uh, if you're not on stage, uh, please keep your mask on. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> and do. still don't touch your face. <laughs> <laughs> and be safe. Um, next week we have a riveting, very dynamic conversation on landscaping. That's right. It's adventures in landscaping, um, making the most out of your garden. No, playing to your garden strengths is what's it's, what it's called. And yes, I will be moderating that program as well, so <laughs> stay tuned. Um, thanks again, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you all for joining us on the intertube, and uh, we'll see you soon. Wow. <laughs> cool. Well, shit. Oh, oh, no, are we still on? Dude. Oh, yeah.